Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant and Jerry, and this is Stuff You Should Know, the podcast. That's right, Josh. Uh, I want to wish you two things. Mm-hmm. Happy anniversary. Yes, happy anniversary. Because the day that we're recording, it was eight years ago this week that we released, well, not we, you. We. I wasn't even there yet. You were here in spirit. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it's when Stuff You Should Know was born. Yeah. 2008, uh, mid-April. Eight years ago. We got Crazy. 42 years to go. <laughs> and happy Bicycle Day. Did you know that uh-huh. it was Bicycle Day when you picked this out? No. Really? Really. That's... Actually, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, um, it was what the thing that prompted it was that recent study about LSD, and I was like, "Oh yeah, we should totally do LSD. We've never done it." And it was, I think, yesterday that I realized today is Bicycle Day. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't in the know, Bicycle Day. It's not about riding bicycles to work. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, somebody on Twitter said every day's Bicycle Day to me. I'm like, <laughs> I bet you don't you must know take a what lot of acid. Day is. <laughs> So, Bicycle Day commemorates the day when um, Albert Hoffman, the discoverer or creator, I guess, depending on how you look at it, of LSD, um, experimented on himself. And part of that included him riding his bike back home from work while he was wigging. Yeah, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But uh, uh, Bicycle Day itself was started in 1985, supposedly by Professor Thomas Roberts of Northern Illinois University. Go Huskies, in commemoration of that, uh, what some people say was a great day in history. Sure. It um, certainly was a day that changed history. You really can't argue that. No. And um, if you want to just hear all things LSD and stuff you should know, we and did two other shows. Mm-hmm. 2008, did the CIA test LSD on unsuspecting Americans? That's a good one. The answer is yes. Mind opening. <laughs> and October 2010, can you treat mental illness with psychedelics? Yeah. And uh, now, in typical stuff you should know, backward form, yeah. we're going to do LSD. Yeah, we like to nibble around the Not edges. do first. LSD. <laughs> right. You know, that'd be weird. Oh, we weren't supposed to? Uh-oh, we better get through this quick. <laughs> We've got about 30 minutes. Uh-oh. Oh, and we should also point out, at the end of this episode, we uh, have uh, John Hodgman on in a very special listener mail audio segment where he rebuts our nostalgia uh, episode. Although, it seems like we agreed more than we yeah, rebutted. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't end up rebutting anything. Yeah, uh, and that's... We worked out the, the, the misunderstanding. How about that? <laughs> yeah, and we, like all times that you sit down with Hodgman, we talked for 30 minutes about one small thing. <laughs> and uh, That's why this episode is super long, because this is going to be long, too. It is. So it's super size, robust. We should sell, like, eight more extra ads. Oh, let's. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Like, Tommy Chong would probably want in on this one. He's got some businesses, doesn't he? Yeah, I shouldn't joke, because sales will be, like, knocking on the door. All right. <laughs> hey, Chuck, really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, Chuck, we're talking about LSD today. Yeah. Um, and LSD, again, that, that bicycle day, that first day 73 years ago, I think, it really did change the world. Because there are very few substances that have ever been created by man that had a more sweeping, profound effect. Yeah. Than LSD. True. Like you kind of, a lot of people associate LSD with hippies, the Grateful Dead, sure. maybe ravers, that kind of thing. But if you really start to kind of poke around popular culture here in the West, yeah. you start to see it turn up everywhere. Yeah, like every American president has taken LSD. Right. Well, it's part of the <laughs> oath of office. Like the uh, Bible is laced with LSD. They put their hand so on it. put their hand on it. Yeah. Actually, let's debunk that myth right now. Apparently, LSD is non-absorbent through the skin. Yeah, which means that those, uh, well, well, there's a bunch of rumors, but the one with Jimi Hendrix would put LSD in his sweatband. <laughs> right. And let it just he, leach he may into have. His forehead. Oh, wouldn't yeah. have done anything. Although it could have trickled down into his mouth. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, here are some other popular LSD myths. I don't think there have been any other drugs that have spawned, maybe these days, but I'm not hip to all these new drugs. Man, and like it's Snopes. impossible to be. I was doing research for this, and I ran across like all the new drugs that are available today. Yeah, it's incredible. There's just like a, a an avalanche of new, new, virtually untested drugs. Yeah, that's being they're they're going from synthesis to human trials 
by way of customer. Yeah. Like people are taking these things and they're essentially like guinea pigs for these things still. It's just extremely dangerous. Yeah, Molly and Billy and Jimmy. No, no, it's and... way beyond that. Jimmy, Jimmy's old news. Jimmy's old news. Uh, here are just a few quickie uh, highlights. Um, the, the guy that thought he was an orange, so he like peeled his skin off. Uh, clearly LSD did that. <laughs> Not true. Uh, college kids who stared at the sun until they were blind. Clearly, LSD is responsible for those children. Uh, lick and stick tattoos given to, out to children at Halloween. LSD. Laced with LSD. Yep. Uh, seven hits will make you legally insane. Right. <laughs> you can use that as a defense in court. Uh, Diane Linkletter uh, jumped from a window because she thought she could fly. So that was a big one. That kind of changed public opinion. Well, she jumped from a window. She definitely did, but she was also suicidal, and oh, yeah. she had taken LSD before. What made it such a huge case was that um, she was Art Linkletter's daughter. Yeah. Art Linkletter at the time, this is I think the early 70s when his daughter committed suicide, um, he was already a bit of a, he was like the Bill Cosby of the age, which is not surprising. In what way? <laughs> in, <laughs> that means a in lot the, of things uh, The moral crusader and kind of um, social scold of everybody and how things are just not like they used to be. And the good old days are so much better. Gotcha. And uh, everybody's just letting their kids get away with so much and pull up your pants and that kind of stuff. Oh, boy. He was a bit like that already. And then his his daughter um, committed suicide, and um, he was understandably uh, devastated by that. And he turned um, his ire toward drugs because she had taken LSD before. But there's no evidence that she was on on LSD at the time. She was already suicidal. But, again, Art Linkletter is going to all of the the kids' parents and saying, like, you can't let your – don't let this happen to your children, too. Scared America's parents and really kind of sealed the deal of public opinion against LSD at the time. Yeah. uh, And how about one more for you? Uh, Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher Doc Ellis throws a no-hitter. Uh, on acid. That's true. That's 100% true. Well, I know we've covered it, doofus. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you were putting one in? To... Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's sorry. a great documentary about it. and um, Doofus. 100% true is the only person's word we have to go on was Doc Ellis's. Let's well, just say his that. girlfriend uh, also, I don't want to say testified, but she she backed it up. She was like, yeah, yeah we took acid. And I did some I more realized research. He was pitching. Uh, into it though and apparently the story changed a bit over the years oh yeah and he also said other things that didn't quite match up so Uh there's a little speculation that he might have gussied it up a little bit oh like the ball was telling him what pitch to throw well and and maybe when he took the acid um so supposedly he took it at noon and he was pitching at like seven yeah 6 30 so i mean he still would have been on acid he just wouldn't have been peaking on acid or something yeah but it's a great documentary you should check it out yeah it's good okay you threw me off with that when you got me. I was <laughs> like, like, oh, no, Chuck. Chuck. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we did an internet roundup on that. Yeah, that's right. So there was another thing, Chuck, that I, I remember growing up with is that acid, if you took acid, it would mess up your chromosome so that when you had offspring, kid, uh-huh. they would be all kinds of messed up, disfigured, deformed, yeah. would have severe um, developmental defects, all sorts of terrible stuff. That's what we call it back in the early 80s, by the way. Yeah. Um, it could put holes in your brain. Yeah, that's another one, too, that everybody ran around believing. And one of the reasons everyone ran around believing all of these weird myths. By the way, no, LSD doesn't affect your chromosomes. It actually uh, is metabolized and out of your system faster than just about any other drug on the planet. Yeah, you pee it out. Very quickly. Yeah. Uh, your liver starts breaking it down immediately. Um So it certainly doesn't affect your chromosomes, and it it doesn't put holes in your brain. But the reason why these myths are around and the reason why people believe them is because the authorities are the ones who either made up these myths or latched onto them and basically amplified them through these kind of public service announcements and through the media. And so a lot of people walked around believing this. And, And on the one hand, you can say, well, that's fine. It kept some kids maybe off of heroin or something. Lying to kids is fine when it comes to drugs. You can make that case, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you can also point to the real chilling effect that the LSD hysteria had on um, understanding consciousness. Yeah. Potentially treating mental illness, yeah. which we're just now starting to realize, like, yeah, it has a lot of potential for that. Yeah. Treating alcoholism. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people whose lives could have been helped had, at the very least, 
uh, science been allowed to continue its inquiry into LSD. But the, the, the fear of LSD was so widespread and so profound mm -hmm. that even science was clamped down. Yeah, the CIA was like, only we can give people <laughs> LSD. Right. Not you scientists yeah. in controlled settings. Right. There's this one guy, I don't know where the lawsuit is now, but he, uh, I don't think we covered it on our show about the CIA, but the family of a guy that supposedly jumped from a window after being dosed by the Olson. CIA. Frank Olson. Yeah, but uh, his family suing the CIA mm -hmm. saying, no, he was beaten up and shoved out the window yeah. because he had information. I think he was actually dosed, though, and he was losing his stuff. I don't know. He was dosed, but their 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 contention, the family's That he was is, thrown out. Is that he was murdered. I saw that, too. Yeah. Yeah. That's that uh, like, the frankolsonproject.org, maybe, yeah, yeah. is what the website is. And we definitely covered that Did in we? The, the CIA thing. Because okay. he definitely, he was around at the time. That happened at that time. Because that yeah. was the time when, like, if you went to a, a party with CIA they were all just dosing one another for fun. Yeah, if you went to a San Francisco CIA party... You, <laughs> you were, were hardcore be, at the time. Yeah, you're going to be drinking acid unwittingly. All right, so we should, uh, even though we've covered it before, the story is so wonderful, we should go over the creation of LSD by Albert Hoffman uh -uh. again. Don't you think? Please begin. You didn't want to skip this, did you? No, I was. Oh, okay. I was. I think we should put in like a little accompanying oh. music or something. The way you set it up is beautiful. Yeah, like uh, some Jefferson Airplane, maybe. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. <laughs> so, um, a Swiss chemist. His name was Albert Hoffman. Uh, like we said a few times, he was working at a lab called Sandoz. Uh, they were a pharma company, and now they're uh, they're still around, but they're a subsidiary. I can't remember who. They're not making drugs anymore. No, they are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so he was working on a project uh, involving something called ergot. It's a fungus. It grows on rye, and it's been blamed, uh, notably, this woman named Linda Caporale. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, she put forth a, a theory that the Salem witch trials were kicked off by a round of ergot poisoning. Yeah. And she has a lot of good evidence. Yeah. Um, I won't go over it all. It's, it's cool to look up, though. And a lot of people came out and were like, you know what? I bet she's right. So you were going to talk about the uh, the Hoffman story. Yeah, so he was working with ergot, uh, which grows on rye, and um, did a lot of poisoning over the years, notably in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Uh, even though they used it medicinally, uh, midwives used it to help speed up labor until they decided in the 19th century, eh, it's pretty dangerous, actually. Yeah. Um, maybe we should just not poison these pregnant women with ergot. Well, they were they were not just giving them ergot to poison them for fun. Apparently, it well, no. it um, contracts muscles, right? Yeah, so it, it would speed up labor. Right, exactly. Um, and they figured out that it that it would actually prev it would slow bleeding. I think by dilating blood vessels, maybe. Oh yeah. So they would give it to a woman after labor, still, but they stopped giving it to them like to to create to put a woman into labor. Gotcha. But it was. Um, it, it was remarkable enough that even after this level of medicine um, went away, scientists were still figuring out they're like there's something with ergot. We've got to be able to do something with it. It's just too potent, right? You know. So uh, in the 1930s, this was the 1930s. It's just so crazy to think about when you see pictures of the 1930s. Yeah, they have like wires hanging everywhere. <laughs> think about their new electric lamps, like experimenting with LSD. It's weird. Uh, but it happened. Um, at the Rockefeller Institute in New York City, they isolated lysergic acid from ergot. And um, this is where Hoffman kind of started his work, uh, resulting in 1938. And the 25th derivative, the number 25, as in he did 24 previous, mm -hmm. he finally landed on LSD 25. And uh, that was kind of it. Yeah, and LSD, we should say, stands for lysergic acid diethylamide. And uh, basically, he started with this lysergic acid um, and just basically tinkered around with it until he, like you said, arrived at LSD-25. And again, he wasn't looking for the most potent psychedelic known to humankind. No, he's looking for medicine. Exactly. He was looking for, I think, a respiratory um, um, stimulator, something yeah. like that, maybe Stimulate for kids circulation. with asthma. Uh -huh. So, yeah, give these kids some LSD-25. <laughs> right. It'll breathe, cure their asthma <laughs> right up. And uh, he, the first time he messed around with it, 
he sent it off to the pharmacologist to look because he was a chemist at Sandoz. Now, chemists at Sandoz, they figure out processes to yeah. extract stuff, to make new compounds, that kind of thing. But that's, that's the sum of their job. Once they come up with a new compound that they're satisfied with, they send it off to the pharmacology department. Yeah. The pharmacology department says, uh, yeah, actually, this made that frog's leg jump by itself all the way across the room. We yeah. think there's some potential here. The pharmacologists got their hands in 1938 on LSD-25, examined it, said, we don't think there's any pharmacological potential here. Throw it away. And Hoffman did as he was told. Five years later, he um, suddenly just thinks about LSD-25 again and is like, you know what? I think they missed something. I'm going to make a new batch just on my own. Yeah, later on he was quoted as saying, I did not choose LSD, LSD found and called me. So him deciding to make a batch on his own is highly irregular. For the sure. first, for one, he's a chemist. You know, the chemists don't go and tell the pharmacologist they miss something. They certainly don't have a hunch five years later they miss something. And then thirdly, for him to make a batch of LSD was very weird. It was contrary to his work orders. And also, ergot was very expensive, and Sandoz was trying to keep a, a lid on expenses. So it was really, really weird that five years later, he mixes up another batch of LSD. That is true. But while he was mixing it up, it was a sort of a little, like a Peter Parker experiment gone wrong. <laughs> right? He got a little inside of him. Somehow. Uh, they think now he probably got it on his fingers and maybe like licked his finger while he was... He had been eating KFC <laughs> for lunch. Yeah, maybe so. And uh, it got into his body, uh, and he, you know, he had an acid trip. He a did. An accidental one at first. The world's first acid trip. That's right. And that happened... Unless uh, one of those pharmacologists was keeping something on the right. down low. <laughs> He's like, yeah, this is useless. Yeah, throw all this away, except just save me like 10 tabs. Just my head stash. <laughs> So that was April 18th, 1943. And um, the next day, Albert Hoffman's like, I got to try that again. Yeah. So he takes some LSD. I think he took 250 micrograms. At 4.20 p.m., believe yes, it or not. I noticed that too. Almost on 4.19. Yeah. But that's a marijuana thing. 4.20 is. Yeah, it just I just it kind of jumped out at me as like. I thought I saw that too. I'm sure everyone who's ever read that was like, oh, dude. <laughs> sure. 419. Oh, he was so close. That's the universe. So he took 250 micrograms. Is that right? Which is about 10 times the minimum dose that an average person takes these days. Yeah, that's a lot. Of and acid. He, he shot it. He injected it intravenously, I believe. Yeah. Didn't and, he? Or did uh, he take it orally? I'm sorry. No, he took it orally. Yeah, I don't, I don't see in there where he injected it. And uh, he started to have a wild ride. He did. He went to the doctor at first. He uh, asked his assistant, and he was like, um, I am tripping. Pretty hard. <laughs> you don't know what that is yet, but I do. And he said, I, I think I should go to the doctor. And he went to the doctor, and the doctor was like, dude, you're fine. Uh, you're not fine, but there's nothing physically going on with you. Right, and we should say uh, he, was at, he made it to his house with his assistant, and they were on their bikes. This is why, where Bicycle Day comes from. Yeah. And he was like, my God. How long did it take for us to get home? And his assistant was like, actually, we made it home really fast. Yeah. And he's like, what? And he's <laughs> freaking out. He's like, go get me some milk from the neighbor. Ends up drinking two liters of milk that night. Yeah, because milk could supposedly quell the effects of different drugs at the time. Yeah. So it, it made sense. It did nothing for this. No, and uh, his neighbor uh, later on, there's a couple of stellar quotes. Let me jump back. Oh, sorry, jump back, Jack. That's all right. After 40 minutes after that initial dose, he wrote down in his journal, 1,700 hours. Beginning dizziness, feeling of anxiety, visual distortions, symptoms of paralysis, desire to laugh. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then following that closely, I was able to write the last words only with great effort. <laughs> <laughs> and then who wrote that last line? <laughs> and when he got the milk, he said... Um, the lady next door, whom I scarcely recognized, brought me milk. She oh, yeah. Was, she was no longer Mrs. R, but rather a malevolent, insidious witch with a colored mask. Yeah. So people think now he was fearful going into this experiment, and that's what, you know, we'll talk about set and setting, and the, your mindset going in has a lot to do with what kind of trip you have. Right. And people think now, like, he went into it fearful and ended up 
by all accounts, having a bad trip. He had a bad trip, but yeah. then the doctor came and was like, "Look, man, I, you, something wacky's going on with you, but physically, you're fine. You don't have to worry about it." And I, I believe that's what kind of freed Hoffman up to have a good time, have a good trip. Yeah. After that, he uh, really started to go, "Oh wow," and really took in what he was seeing, what he was thinking, what he was experiencing, and um, moved from dysphoria to euphoria. Is a, a the way he would have put it. That's right. And he goes into work the next day, tells everyone about this amazing experience, and uh, everyone else tries it. Well, th- not everyone, but other people at Sandoz. His it. two bosses did. I yeah. think his boss and his boss's boss. <laughs> and the the reason they were like, "Nah," was because he said, "I took two hundred and fifty micrograms." They're like, "That's astounding! Two hundred and fifty micrograms." Yeah, that's nothing. Right? That, that they've never heard of a compound having the kind of effects that Hoffman was reporting. Yeah. And he's like, "I measured it myself. I know what I was doing, and it was two hundred and fifty micrograms." These guys each took a third of that, mm-hmm. and they tripped pretty hard themselves. Sure. And from that moment on, Sandoz was like, "We're onto something here." Yeah. He also experimented on uh, animals. He started dosing. Boy, you name it. He gave it to mice, and he said they moved erratically and showed alterations in licking behavior. They taught themselves to tie-dye? Uh, cats. Cats' hair stood on end, and they salivated. He put cats and mice together, and instead of the cats attacking the mice, uh, said the felines would ignore the rodents or sometimes even appear frightened by them. How about that? Yeah, that's uh, a cat on a bad trip. It said chimpanzees did not show any obvious signs of being affected, but normal chimps around them became upset which he, his theory was they failed to maintain these weird social norms that are only perceptible to other chimps. Yeah. Fish swam oddly. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, spiders altered web building patterns. At low doses, uh, the webs were even better proportioned and more exactly built than normally. But in higher doses, the webs were badly and rudiment- uh, rudimentarily made. Yeah. So he would give it like, look, there's a roach crawling across the floor. Let's dose it. See what happens. And there, there's also a very famous case, and it wasn't Hoffman who, who tested it. This dude in Oklahoma um, who was a professor of maybe pharmacology, I'm not sure, psychology, he shot an elephant. He got his hands on the like Oklahoma City Zoo's <clears throat> elephant and shot it full of LSD. Oh, my God. The elephant like trumpeted once, fell on its side, started seizing its eyes rolled back on its head. It bit part of its tongue off. It stayed like this for an hour. He finally, ultimately, a lot of people point to this as a a fatality from LSD, proving that you can die. There's such a thing as a fatal overdose from LSD. Wow. Um, But other people say, well, actually, then he shot the elephant with even more tranquilizers to try to calm it down, and that's probably what killed the elephant. But this guy gave this. I've ever heard. But it it was like that for like an hour and a half, just suffering on just a, a. enormous amount of acid and the guy actually used to boast about it he he kind of wore it like a badge like it made his career and it was just such a foul thing yeah. that even the scientologists were mad about it and released like <laughs> articles criticizing the guy in his work really but, yeah and then there's a lot of questions about whether he's actually um a, a cia funded scientist as well well he had a blowgun that's the first thing they give you when you sign up for the cia <laughs> Here's your blowgun and gallon of LSD. Yeah, but R.I.P. Tusky the elephant. He went in a really bad way. Was that his name? Yep. That's terrible. Yep. Uh, so, long story short, uh, Sandoz is on to something. Um, they say this research is compelling. We're going to patent this stuff and market it as uh, Delicid, Delicid, D-E-L-Y-S-I-D in 1947. And uh, they started advertising it for use like, Psychiatrist, you should get some of this stuff. Get some. You should use it yourself and use it on your patients and see what happens. They said, again, I just want to repeat what Chuck said, use it on yourself. Well, yeah, you, so you know what's going on. Exactly. Well, that's highly irregular compared to the psychiatry of today. They don't usually go like, here's a, here's a couple of Xanny bars for you to try. <laughs> just, you know, eat some and then you'll know what your patients are going through. They don't do that anymore. No, come on. So... <laughs> Well, the, 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 they're not supposed to, Chuck. Okay. Um, but, yeah, Sandoz was, like, sending this stuff out as uh, an experimental drug. That's how it was labeled at first. And as it caught on, um, it, they moved it into, like, full-on marketing and started selling them, like, hotcakes. 
Yeah, it's pretty neat. If you look up uh, Delisid for Google Images, you know, it's just packaged right there. It looks like it's a very 1960s box. Sure. It says Delisid LSD 25. Yeah. Here it is in the vials. So weird. And they came in uh, 25 microgram doses, which is a, it's a low dose. It's about half of what an average dose you would buy today would be. At a fish concert. I guess. <laughs> I'm sure. That's even a dated reference. What, yeah. what are people doing LSD these days? EDM shows? Sure. Uh, Skrillex shows. Okay. How about that? <laughs> That's probably dated. It probably. We're so We're old, yet. Chuck. I know. We're old. Uh, Billy Joel concert? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> people inject LSD at Billy Joel concerts right in their eyeball. So by... Um, by the mid 1960s uh, is when it actually became illegal. In 1966, well, hold on, Sando hold on. stopped making it. Before that, though, as when it was selling like hotcakes, yeah. like it was having a a real beneficial effect in the psychiatric setting. Oh yeah, forty thousand doses were given to patients. Forty thousand patients got doses just in the U.S. alone. Okay. Right? I mean, like, a lot of doses were sold, and that was just the U.S., and yeah. it was having an effect. And in, in Europe, they used it for um, this, they, they used it for, uh, I can't remember what it was called. I want to say, like, psychotronic or something like that, where they just give you, like, the, the average dose, maybe two pills, a low dose, and then they would talk about your childhood and that kind of thing. They used it to, to kind of disarm the patient, right? In the U.S., they used what was called psychedelic therapy, where they would give you about 10 times the minimum dose, about what Hoffman took when he experimented on himself, right? And that was meant to just not not just break down your defenses, but to, to completely uh, blow your mind, basically, so that when you came back down, you had had all these revelations and you were essentially a better person with a more fulfilled sense of self and meaning in your life. Yeah, those were the two schools of thought. Like in Europe, we'll talk about your childhood and give you a little acid. Right. In America, we're going to open all these doors of perception. And the thought was that you could skip years of psychotherapy. Right. With like a, a good acid trip. And a lot of people had this experience. Very famously, Cary Grant was um, hugely into acid as a result of going to see his psychiatrist in Beverly Hills. And there's a really, really great article from Vanity Fair from a few years back called Cary in the Sky with Diamonds that I would strongly recommend going and reading because it's really interesting. And it gives you a really good glimpse of this era where like, like the Mad Men era but everybody's taking LSD for at their psychiatrist's office for eight hours. Well, there was a LSD episode for Mad Men. Right. I think it's mentioned in that article. It's It, it was one of the best of a great show. Yeah. When uh, Roger Sterling takes acid. Yeah. It, was it at his psychiatrist? Uh, no. It was... Um, it was just like a, you know, like a party. Right, okay. But, it, but like a party where they were saying, like, do this to expand your mind. It wasn't, you know, like right. slip to him or anything. Right, gotcha. Yeah. But it had a profound effect on him in the show. And Chuck, there's actually this awesome little quote from Cary Grant that makes it in that, uh, that article about his experience with LSD. One of them, at least. He said, um, when I first started under LSD, I found myself turning and turning on the couch. And you have to imagine Cary Grant saying this too, sure. right? Which makes it even better. Oh, I am. I said to the doctor, why am I turning on the sofa? And he said, don't you know why? And I said, I didn't have the vaguest idea, but I wondered when it was going to stop. When you stop it, he answered. Well, it was like a revelation to me. He, he, he felt like he was under the spell of LSD or there was whatever. He, he realized like he had control over his life. Wow. It's kind of cool. Nice. So it, it did have a really big effect on, on people in real life as well. But like you said, very quickly in very short order, within 10, 12 years of it being marketed for the first time by Sandoz, it starts to become outlawed around the country and around the world. Yeah, by 1965, uh, not a lot of research was done in the United States. Um, by 1969, there were only six projects conducted. By 74, the uh, National Institute of Mental Health said that it had no therapeutic value. And then the final experiments in the United States took place in the 1980s. Uh, and those studies and most of the newer studies now uh, are concerned with end of life care and terminally ill patients. Yeah, but the 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 uh, window is starting to open once more to studying LSD and its effects on neurology and um, psychiatry and that kind of stuff. Yeah, 
Um, and actually, when it started to get outlawed and Sandoz stopped making it, they recalled their stocks of it and um, handed it over to the National Institutes of Mental Health for study. But within a few years, the National Institutes of Mental Health said, like, no, no therapeutic value whatsoever. Yeah. Despite 40,000 people in the U.S. alone basically singing its praises, no therapeutic value whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I don't know if all 40,000 people said it was great. I would say a significant portion of them. If you go back and look at the media yeah. coverage of it at the time, it was mostly favorable. It was very promising. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're going to take a break here and come back and teach everyone how to make LSD. <laughs> Learning stuff with Joshua and Charles, stuff you should know. All right, Josh. All right. Uh, the first thing that you want to do if you want to make LSD is be a really, really good qualified chemist. Yeah, with a really good qualified setup. Yeah, this is not meth. You can't go to Walmart. Making it in a Mountain Dew bottle. And make it in a Mountain Dew bottle on aisle six. Right. Uh, shake it up real good and you've got meth. Yeah. Um, this is, the, the ingredients are tough to get and they're highly regulated yeah they're not sure. found on drugstore shelves no it's very different no plus i mean you can start with um and there's actually other natural sources of lsd precursors including um morning glory seeds and hawaiian baby woodrose seeds yeah and there are some lsd recipes that call for extracting the stuff called lsa um from these things and starting with that but it's it's a coin toss what kind of quality your ultimate LSD is going to be. Yeah. Because you don't know how, how good the LSA is in these things. Plus, the government, um, in a nod to their prohibition era tactics, actually put a toxic coating on these seeds yeah. to discourage people from using them to create LSD or even eating them, which some people do. Right. So I guess if you're a legitimate LSD chemist, you are starting with ergot. Like Hoffman did. That's right. Just like in the old days, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, what you want to do, uh, you get this fungus, uh, which is the ergot, uh, and you have to culture it to extract the alkaloids from that ergot. Right. And you have to have a dark room because uh, just like sheets of acid can be contaminated by sitting it out in the sun in the back of your Jetta. <laughs> Uh, the fungus itself will decompose under bright light. Right. So you got to do some of this early work in a dark room. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, you take the ergot, once you have it extracted, um, you, you're, you're isolating the alkaloids, right? Ergot alkaloid. Yeah. And um, when you've got the alkaloid, you add some solvents and reagents to it, which themselves are dangerous as well. Yeah. Um, one of them is chloroform, which is a no-joke chemical. Yeah, Hoffman actually the next day thought, he didn't quite n know for sure that it was the LSD, so he huffed chloroform because he thought, uh, you know, it was probably the chloroform. He's like Jeff Bridges in The Vanishing. <laughs> no, so he huffed some chloroform and I guess woke up a little while later and said, nope, that wasn't acid. No, nope. <laughs> something different. Must be the LSD. Um, so chloroform's not good for you. Um, another one of the reagents is uh, anhydrous hydrazine, which sounds like a Douglas Adams character. Yeah. And it's a known carcinogen, very poisonous, and both of them are easily breathed in and absorbed through the skin. Yeah. So it's these things are no joke, and they're important in in uh, turning ergot alkaloids into LSD. That's so right. it's very difficult, very dangerous if yes. you're not getting that picture. Yeah, hopefully no one's like setting up in their kitchen and like following along. It's we'd say. Well, I mean, <laughs> you would get nowhere very quickly. We're not giving out detailed information and. What's funny, it's funny you bring that, because in, until I think like 1965, yeah. you could mail off to the U.S. Patent Office, and for 50 cents, they would mail you the, the patent to yeah. LSD, which is the recipe for LSD. Wow. You could get it directly from the U.S. government for a few years. I bet it's online somewhere, don't you think? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. yeah. On the dark web? Probably not even. <laughs> On I Can Has Cheeseburger? Probably. <laughs> So uh, the ergot alkaloid is then synthesized into lysergic acid compound. It's called isolysergic acid hydrolyze. I'm sorry, hydrazide. Nice. And uh, you, add, you do that by adding some chemicals, heat it up a little bit. Yeah. 
shake it in your milk jug. Put a little basil <laughs> in there. Um, is it okay to joke about this? If it's not okay to joke do, about right? this, Chuck, then we've lost our sense of humor. That's right. Uh, then that is isomerized, which means, and this is pretty advanced chemistry, but it's really advanced chemistry. Yeah. Uh, it means the atoms are actually, the molecules are being rearranged in a chemical process. Right. With a little heat, a little reagent, yeah. solvent, that kind of stuff. It's taking a compound and basically doing the old switcheroo, and then bam, you have an entirely <laughs> new chemical as a result. That's right. So um, you cool that down, you mix it up with an acid and a base, evaporate right. it, and you are left with isolysergic uh, diethylamide. Isomerize it again. Uh-huh. Because, you know, if once is good, two is better. <laughs> then you have LSD, and it's it comes in the form of a crystallized powder, uh, I believe. I think it also says you can also make it a liquid. No, you have to do something else to make it a liquid. So it, when you have LSD that you've synthesized from ergot alkaloids, yeah, it, it's a crystalline powder, a white powder. Yeah, and in the old days, in the in the sixties, um, you could make micro dots, which was a tablet form. Uh, you could just mix it with liquid and, you know, use it like, a, you know, put this drop under your tongue. Right. Um, or, you know, make tea out of it or whatever. Uh, and then window pane, which was gelatin squares. So that's still around. I saw on Reddit yeah. some kid was like, look at this. And he was holding like a huge thing of window panes. And I think he called them well, window panes too. Yeah, they're uh, the great, great movie, Flirting with Disaster. Do they take gel tabs? Well, the, one of the, the son, Lily Tomlin and Alan Alda's son, at the <laughs> right. end of the movie, doses everyone at dinner right. with window pane. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he calls it. Yeah. And I always just think that that's a funny word for it. Uh, but these days, you're more than likely going to see what's called blotter acid. Uh, and what they do is they just dissolve that powder in ethanol and then dip a sheet of blotting paper that's conveniently uh, perforated into tiny little squares. Mm -hmm. About and, a quarter inch by a quarter inch? Yeah, they're little, and, and you, it soaks up into that paper. Um, sometimes the paper is just plain white. Sometimes it's got little cartoon characters and things. Oh, a lot of times. And uh, then that's, you know, that's a sheet of acid. Right. There's actually a dude in San Francisco who has an acid museum, and he has a book, like a, a huge binder yeah. of sheets of acid just to basically show off the right. artistry on it. And um, it's like, how has this not been rated by the DEA? I think the answer to that is because the DEA doesn't know it exists. It's probably fake, right? No. I would say that's stupid because it's he, just his, a waste of money. His, um, well, I, I mean, he wanted like, to preserve it Like, why wouldn't you just put fake paper in there and tell everyone it's acid? Because what he's, he's not trying to sell it. He's trying to say, like, look at the art that people make No, no, that's for, what I'm saying, though. Why would he waste all that money putting the drug on something? Uh, he's he not, he's put, buying it. I, I don't follow. Like, he's going out and being like, wow, that's a really beautiful sheet of acid. Oh. I'm going to buy it and put it in my museum. Well, that's even dumber. <laughs> so he said that these things have been exposed to light over the years and that they're they're most likely totally inactive. That he was said that the last thing. 12 times I tried to take it, it didn't work. <laughs> He's like, but I, I traveled back in time <laughs> so maybe a couple of times. <laughs> so uh, each uh, square is a dose, and you can get up to 900 doses on a single sheet. Uh, and we'll get to this later, but the well, we might as well talk about it now. Uh, there was a Supreme Court ruling in early 90s mm. where they said um, the weight of the drug is also the weight of the paper, which... Uh, it's nuts. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people got really up and remain upset about this. Uh, the, the argument is that's the equivalent of saying, well, this cocaine came in this um, suitcase, so just weigh the suitcase right. with the cocaine. Right. And if it adds eight pounds, then it adds eight pounds. Right. Uh, instead of measuring the actual quantity of the drug itself... It's measuring the carrier device. Right. And one reason they did that was because the weight of, again, LSD, when you're looking at a minimum dose of about a quarter quarter of a microgram, yeah. that's like the, the weight of two grains of salt. Yeah. So if you're trying to bust people, you could be like, well, a quarter microgram gets you a year or well, something Well, that's like why that. I don't see why they didn't do that. Just rewrite the law to reflect the weight of the real drug. I don't know. Because that's all they'd have to do. I know. It was, you know. It was very weird. It's ham-fisted. Yeah. Can I say that? Yeah, you just did. But the long and short of that is there are people uh, that dealt acid at a fish show that are in prison for longer than, you know, rapists and murderers. Oh, yeah. There's a guy who's um, 
in prison for life without parole. Yeah. He's like 66 now. He's been in there for a while because he got busted with some acid. Yeah. Um, for life. Yeah. His, he's spending his life in jail because he had acid with him. And he's seen violent criminals all around him get yeah, out on parole. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Pretty interesting. Uh, so should we talk about what an LSD trip is like? Yeah. According to whoever wrote this article, I think this is a Shana Freeman joint. Yeah, I thought most of this was pretty good. There and were a few parts that I was like, "Come on!" It was, uh, yeah, very straightforward yeah. and uh, logical and Not reasonable bad. and rational and myth busting too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so the hallucinations that one would have on LSD, uh, I think there's there's a bit of a misnomer there in that. Some people might think, oh, you know, I saw a pink elephant come in the room and sit down beside me, and I thought it was real. Um, that's not exactly what they mean by an LSD hallucination. No. Uh, what they mean more is, um, you know, I stared at the wall, and the wall looked like it was pulsating and breathing. Right. Or that painting had a glow around it. Uh, and it, and it's also a case of not, oh, my God, what's happening to my brain? It's, oh, my God, this acid is awesome. Right. Or bad or strong, but but I know that I'm on a drug and it's making all these hallucinations happen. Precisely, right. Is that a fair way to say it? Yeah, it's a great way to say it. I mean, it's it's, it's away from the classical definition of a hallucination because you don't, and it's also, you don't don't believe what you're seeing is like real. You realize that it's the result of the drug. Although I'm sure some people have taken acid and really uh, thought like, you know, it's done such a number on their brain that they didn't know. That they were on the drug, which is why you have your buddy there to say, no, 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 that's the acid. Right. Well, that's that's another point that um, Shana Freeman makes in this article is that because of the the trip and how what a profound impact it has on the brain, um, you typically want to trip with other people yeah. who have experienced tripping in a very calm place. And you mentioned set and setting earlier. I think that was Timothy Leary that came up with that. And set reminds uh, refers to mindset. Yeah. And setting refers to the setting that that you in, you take your acid in, right? So you want to be in a positive frame of mind, or else you're going to probably have a bad trip. And you want to take it in a calm, comfortable setting, like your home. Or Shana Freeman suggests the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe don't if you're stressed out about finals. Maybe don't take acid before you go to class to take those finals. You're probably going to have a bad time. That would betray set and setting in a profound way. Exactly. So the trip itself um, typically lasts for something between maybe 7 to 12 hours. About halfway through, uh, you're going to experience what's called the peak. And the whole thing's going to really start about 30 to 60 minutes after you take acid. Uh, yeah, and if you've ever been to college and seen someone taking acid... Like on the dorm floor, mm-hmm. you might hear a lot of like, I don't know if it's working yet. I don't think it's working yet. <laughs> I don't know. I think we got ripped off, man. I don't think. And then all of a sudden. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then you just shut their door and then you go and study like a good student. Right. Physically, Josh, you might have dilated pupils, uh, increased blood pressure. You know, your body temperature might raise. You might get a little sweaty and dizzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might be drowsy. Um you might be tingly in the extremities. Right. Your stomach might feel kind of weird. You have a metallic sensation in your mouth. Yeah, you're probably not hungry. Right. Um, and you may, uh, you're seeing things in a very weird way. You will probably start to notice patterns basically in the air. You could see a wall breathing, like you said. Sure. Um, you're going to see things in a different way than you normally do is the best way to put it. Um, in some extreme cases, some people have reported synesthesia triggering yeah. in them where their senses are basically getting mixed up. I wonder if they're synesthetes. Maybe in that like unlocked it. Maybe. Um, it, I'm, that's entirely possible because uh, there's a pretty well-established school of thought that says that if you are predisposed to a um, brain-based mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar yeah. disorder, um, taking LSD can hasten its onset. It's not going to give you schizophrenia. It's not going to give you bipolar disorder. Right. But if you were already predisposed to it and the symptoms hadn't started yet, right. it could hasten that. True. Uh, emotionally, uh, Shana points out that it kind of can run the gamut from happiness and euphoria 
uh, you love everything, you love everyone, everything's magical. That's the key word right there. What's that? Magical. Yeah. Everything seems magical to you. Or it can go the other way, um, and you can have, you know, bad emotions, and that's, you know, probably part of the bad trip if you go into it in the wrong headspace like we talked about. But that's the crux of it still. The the magic is still the crux of it. Sure. R- regardless of whether you're having a euphoric or a dysphoric experience, right. it still seems to have supernatural qualities to it. It's not yeah. just normal um, having a bad experience, bad mood kind of thing. It's like the it's universe profound. is coming apart and it's it's uh, all reflecting poorly on my life. Yeah, uh, and I think with a lot of hallucinogenics, that's why they're used in, in spiritual and religious ceremonies mm-hmm. uh, all over the world right. because it's a profound experience. It can make you very contemplative. Uh, you know, the things you think, it, it can make uh, people look inward and uh, discover things about themselves. And so that's why, I mean, like ayahuasca and uh, mm-hmm. or ayahuasca? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca? Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. It's in there somewhere. (laughs) And Magic Mushrooms, we did a great episode on that. Yeah. Um, They've been used for millennia around the campfire. Yeah. uh, For people to like, you know, quote unquote, unlock these doors in their mind that they don't readily have access to. The doors of perception. That's right. Uh, If you are an observer of people on LSD and you're not on an LSD, you might think, man, they're talking a lot about really things that aren't very important. But to the person on the LSD, it's very important. It's the most important thing in the world at that moment. Right. And uh, the, the person not on LSD and the person on LSD will both mutually scare one another. Yeah, and you usually end up in different rooms at a party. Sure. Uh, and then there is the uh, the, the time jumps. Um, it just really will mess with your sense of time, according to research. And they will say that uh, you might think you've been doing something for five minutes and it's been an hour. Or it might be the reverse. Right. And you might not have any idea how much time is passing. So whether uh, you're having a good trip or a bad trip, the one thing that all trips are going to have in common is that they end within about 12 hours or so. Like the magical thinking goes away. What you would perceive as normal reality starts to set back in. And um, there may be some sort of emotional or mental hangover. Not a hangover like one that alcohol brings on, but more just like a whoa kind of thing. Yeah, after a profound emotional mental exercise. Or being put through the grinder. Sure. Um, you, you're going to, you will have some sort of, you'll be awash in something. Yeah, agreed. But you, reality will return That's eventually. Right. That makes sense that you would have an emotional hangover, Chuck, because... LSD basically mimics the shape of serotonin and kind of hijacks your serotonin receptors is how it does its thing. So serotonin is in part responsible for mood regulation, emotions, that kind of thing. So it makes sense that you'd be a little wacky the day after you trip on LSD. Interesting. Uh, Sometimes you might uh, see a a I always say college students. I keep picking on college students. I mean, that I seems would to be guess when it happens. about 98% <laughs> of acid trips are Probably undertaken so. by college students. Um, you might see a college student uh, admit themselves to the ER or call an ambulance. Um, <laughs> the, the doctor's like, this was a terrible decision on your part. Yeah, and you go, why are you talking to me about this? Just heal me. And the doctor will pat you on the head and... Put you in a in a quiet room. And no, maybe... no, the doctor meant coming to the hospital while oh. you're on acid. <laughs> I got you. Uh, but when you get to the ER, the doctor will pat you on the head, put you in a nice, quiet, dark room, re- reassure room. you <laughs> that everything is okay. Uh, they may give you some anti-anxiety meds or a tranquilizer to sort of chill you out a little bit. But basically, they just uh, keep you in there and tell a nurse, like, do me a favor every hour, go in there and make sure that guy isn't breaking some equipment. Right. And he'll be fine and, you know. Sounds like about six hours. Yeah. So that's tripping. Tripping 101. Um, you want to take another break before we get into, like, what's going on in your mind? Yeah, why not? All right. So, uh, everybody, bear with us, man. Learning stuff with Joshua and Charles. Stuff you should know. 
So, Chuck, what's going on? Right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, you just went and pee-peed. You went to the little podcaster's room. <laughs> and now you're back. During the break? That's what's going on. Uh, what's going on in the mind, you mean? Yes. On LSD? Yeah. Funny you should ask. Uh, here's the deal. When this article was written, uh, she said researchers aren't 100% sure what LSD is doing in the brain. They still aren't 100% sure. No, we have a better idea, though. A much better idea. Um, well, let as me go of, back of, a little bit. As of 2016. Well, yeah, this this one was from 2011. A Yale psychiatrist named Andrew Sewell, uh-huh. uh, one of the few dudes in the U.S. who uh, does psychedelic drug research. He's not L7. He's not square. <laughs> Remember that band, L7? Yeah, yeah, they were good. Yeah. Remember, it was them, the Breeders, and Four Non Blondes all came out with like great albums all at once. And Hole. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take issue with Hole all right. and Four Non Blondes. I'll take that one back. No, Four Non Blondes, they have that Hey Ah song. That whole album was pretty good. All right. It wasn't bad. Okay. I was listening to Pavement the entire time. You could listen to all of it. All right. I was listening to Pavement too. No, I'm just kidding. I liked L7 though. Um, Andrew Sewell, uh, he was a Yale psychiatrist, like I said, or maybe still is. And he said at the time, uh, that it had to do with the thalamus. Sensory impressions are routed through the thalamus, which acts as a gatekeeper. So his theory at the time, which was, uh, built upon research from Franz Vollenweide, (laughs) Switzerland, said that, uh, drugs like LSD and psilocybin, um, they tone down the thalamus's activity. So in other words, the gatekeeper doesn't work. Uh, the, the, he likened it to, to a spam filter on email. Mm-hmm. So it's not working as well. So it lets, uh, it lets unprocessed information through to consciousness. Which is a great explanation of it. That was 2011, you, but like you got this that from, week. You got that from live science, right? Yeah, I think yeah, so. That was a good, good explanation of it. Yeah, but we have brand new hot off the presses information. Which, I, which doesn't necessarily contradict that, right? Agreed. So I think uh, Imperial College of London researchers got their hands on some acid, gave them to some people, and threw them in a wonder machine yeah, and 20, looked at their brain. 20 volunteers. Volunteers, we should add. Right. That had all taken LSD oh, before. Yeah, <laughs> this wasn't against their will. No, and that uh, they wanted people that have tripped before and people that knew they could handle mm. taking acid and being in an MRI machine, which we already have mentioned is weird and loud and right. claustrophobic. Right. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. That was very wise of those guys. Yes. So the upshot of it was that we now have brain scans of people under the influence of LSD for the first time in human history. And it's it, it's really kind of opened up some new ideas for what's going on on an acid trip. And you should see the difference of these, like the comparison, the control oh, yeah. brain scan. It's amazing. And the one on acid, it's like, you don't even have to read the caption to know which one's which. <laughs> like one is like, oh, okay, I'm, I guess I'm thinking. I'm aware of myself. Uh, my toe itches. Uh, <laughs> well, how am I going to pay the water bill this month? And then the other one's just like. <laughs> yeah. Like that. It's amazing uh, what they said. I'm just going to read it because they say it better than I ever could. Um, they said LSD simultaneously creates hyper connections across the brain, allowing the functions of seemingly unrelated regions of the brain to ooze into one another. At the same time, the drug apparently chips away at organization within networks, like all of this sounds like right on the money, Mm -hmm. Uh, including a system the brain defers to at rest called the default mode network. Yeah, that's a big one. uh, Which normally governs functions uh, such as self-reflection, bing, uh, autobiographical memory, bing, and mental time travel, bing, bing. Right, so what, what what they're saying is, is that the idea that you see things differently, that you think about things differently, that you understand concepts like the universe and reality and your place in it differently than you normally do yeah. is 100% accurate. Like LSD changes literally the way you think about the world by changing the connections in your brain. Yeah, and notably they point out um, in the 60s you would always hear a lot about the ego and the sense of self. Right. Uh, they they think they have proven through brain scans that LSD literally makes you forget your sense of self for that time. Right, and, and it allows you to do something that LSD is very famous for, which is make you feel connected to the universe, to humanity, to 
the gazelle population right. to everything, just feel connected. And again, it's called um, ego dissolution, right? Yeah, which is a, a one of the, you know, it supports the notion that when you take acid with somebody, you have this bond with them, uh, perhaps even a lifelong bond. They also found that the effects, the psychological effects in the individual as well, have lasting impacts as well. So it's not just like you're on the drug, you're under the influence of the drug, what you're thinking and feeling um, is temporary. It actually creates a pronounced and most commonly positive change in the individual's outlook on life and sense yeah. of well-being, which is pretty amazing. But now yeah. we have brain scans of it. The brain scans just in every way seem to support everything everyone has always said. Not everyone, but the people that weren't making up stories about acid right. said about acid. The people who never said, oh, I see a pink <laughs> elephant in the room. That's right. The people who never went up to somebody and like waved their hand in front of their face. Oh, yeah. Those I people. I saw somebody do that like a couple summers ago at my neighborhood pool. Oh, really? There's this dude behaving strangely, and I was like, I wonder. And then somebody went up and went like that to him. I was like, oh, now I know. Oh, wow. So super promising research, and I think it's awesome that they're looking into this stuff again. Um, do you, are they doing this in the United States at all yet? Because didn't they sort of allow it again yes, a there, few years ago? There was a 2014 um, study with like 12 uh, – terminally ill patients with cancer. In the United States? Yeah. But it's still like very small groups of scientists are probably working on this Yeah, like, like 12. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're using very small study populations. But the results yeah. that they're finding, like in this case, um, the, that the cancer patients reported even 12 months on a more positive outlook on life, despite the fact that their life was coming to an end prematurely, in yeah. their opinion. Um because of the acid, they're finding like all of these, the studies that are being carried out are are finding such sweeping um, conclusions uh -huh. ab about the potential for LSD to positively impact people's lives that um, they're all of them are like, we need more studies, more studies, more right. studies. We need more people involved in them. Like, let's get back to studying this, which we left off of like 40, 50 years ago well, yeah. for no good reason, really. And, and 40 and 50 years ago is when the scientists thought like they were on the cusp of making some real breakthroughs right. when everything gets shut down. Um, and back then, like the, the way they do the studies now, it seems like are way better. They didn't have controls back then. They didn't use controls in most right. of these well, like, experiments. Timothy Leary was carrying out these studies. I mean, give me a break. All right, let's talk about acid flashbacks. This False. is uh Yeah, I mean, Shanna calls it very controversial among LSD users and researchers. Um I'm gonna say false outright because there's zero evidence that it's a real thing. And that the body actually uh -huh. retains some bit of LSD, but you've heard, you know, the rumors like it's in your spinal fluid. Yeah. Uh, it's in your fatty deposits. And years later, you can be sitting in a meeting and have a full-on hallucinatory acid flashback. Right. There's no mechanism that this could be carried out by where there's like just, yeah, like your, your body stores some acid for later and you start to trip again suddenly. There are people who have reported it, um, but it's entirely possible that they're mentally ill. Right, or it's entirely possible they're suffering from something called hallucinogen, hallucinogen, <laughs> hallucinogen persisting perceptive disorder. This sounds pretty awful, if you ask me. Yeah, and this uh, I did a little more research. Apparently, this is linked to persistent LSD use. Um, someone who's done a lot of acid, and it is even then, it's still not due to a buildup of LSD molecules in the body. So what, maybe they rearranged their neural connections? Well, it says... Or uh, were they also predisposed to mental illness? Well, I think a lot of times it says current medical opinion is divided as to the cause. Uh, some people think it's a form of uh, PTSD. Other people think it, there were changes in the brain morphology hmm. because they did so much acid. Huh. But it's still not like the old story, like you had acid in your body from a trip long ago, right now it was you're just reactivated. You're just like burned out sitting in the corner. Yeah, and supposedly in 1991 is where this was all born at an educational meeting for a DEA agents in San Francisco. A speaker said, uh, he suggested that the re-release of LSD hidden in the bodies of users 
led to untimely psychotic flashbacks. And uh, no one has tape of this, but there are people that wrote about it and all evidence points to like, this is where the acid flashback uh, myth myth was born huh. was from this one speaker. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Who way, knows? Way to go, dude. <laughs> so, um, again, we were talking about like, there's a lot of hysteria surrounding LSD. People have died on LSD. What's, what's at issue is, well, a couple fold. One, is there a lethal dose of LSD? Yeah. That's never been proven. Right. Despite the millions of acid trips that people have taken, it's never been conclusively shown that LSD led to the death of a human being. Yeah, I would assume, like, there's a lethal dose of water. Right. So I would assume if you drank five gallons of LSD, you might die. Yeah. But then it, it's so out of the realm of believability, it's just like, why even talk about it? Right. And there have been cases of people ingesting massive amounts of LSD. So the minimum dose is a quarter microgram, which is um, like... 25 thousandths of a gram, I believe. Is that like what an acid hit is these days? Like a I think it's, that's about hit? a half of a, a hit. Okay. It's a mild hit from what I understand. So if you go splitsies with your girlfriend at the <laughs> fish concert? <laughs> then you'd have like, yeah, yeah, th- that would be that kind of dose, I guess, right? Gotcha. So um, the, the, that's, a, that's a very small amount, like thousandths of a gram. Some people have taken... Like, no, thousandths of a milligram, I'm sorry. Okay. That's, the, that's yeah. the dose. Some people have taken milligrams of this stuff wow. accidentally. Um, there was a group of people in 1975 in a, a, at a party, and they thought they were snorting cocaine, but it turned out they were snorting powdered LSD. Boy, oh boy. And one person was shown to have had seven, have ingested seven milligrams of LSD. Unbelievable. So that's like 70,000 times... The minimum dose, something like that? Yeah, and I think uh, this is actually in the Western Journal of Medicine, and they, most of the people just, boom, it knocked them out immediately, and they passed out. <laughs> the people that were awake, well, everyone went to the hospital. Right. Uh, because it was, by all accounts, an overdose of LSD, but every everyone was fine. So that's what it was. That's like 7,000 micrograms, and a minimum dose is a quarter of a microgram. Yeah. So, yeah, th- like 12 hours later... They were fine. And 12 years later, they five of them were examined for years uh, for long-term issues. Um, and no one had any issues at that party, at least. Right. There's another one, uh, another person who shows up in one study. I'm not sure what the, the case was around it, but the person survived ingesting 40 milligrams, which is 40,000 micrograms. Wow. Um, and apparently survived. So, so... The, the toxic dose, the LD50 dose, which is where half of the people who took that dose would be expected to die. Right. Um, it's never been established. We don't know what it is, but it's, it, it's huge. It's yeah. massive. So the f- pharmacological deaths from LSD have probably never happened. What, what, is, what has been documented is behavioral deaths. People who um, took risks potentially that um, they wouldn't normally have under the influence of LSD, yeah, maybe I, went swimming sure. in a place they wouldn't have normally gone swimming, maybe jumped from a building, not because they thought they could fly or anything like that. But because I think I can make it to the ledge right. and go party over there. Whereas if they were under normal conditions, they wouldn't have engaged in that behavior. Yeah, so you, so yeah you, poor judgment, basically. R- right, right. But again, those are pretty few and far between, although when they do happen, they're they're tragic. Yeah, and there there are also cases of like heart attacks and strokes, but um th- with something like that there's usually other drugs involved and you can't conclusively say like the LSD caused the heart attack. Right. There's also apparently no documented confirm- confirmed report of somebody committing suicide under the influence of LSD. It's more like Art Linkletter's daughter, somebody who had taken LSD before, right? And the L, their L, their previous LSD use was blamed for it, but right. there's, from what I could find, not a documented case of someone who was on LSD and went nuts and killed themselves, right? And even then, I think uh, it would be, it's a, that's a difficult thing to prove that something caused something, right? Uh, because then you start digging into that person's. Uh, closet and find out that they were suicidal anyway and this was a long time coming um who knows 
It's, it's a tough thing to prove. The upshot of it is that the documented evidence of the positive effects that LSD can have on the human psyche um, vastly outnumber the recognized tragic events that have taken place as a result of LSD. Can I read this one part about heavy LSD users? Because I yeah. thought this is kind of funny. Uh, heavy LSD users can develop profound social problems, uh, completely ruin their sleep cycles, and lose interest in eating and personal hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. turn into hippies is what they're saying. Yeah, and, and she says something I do take issue with, that there's no one in, in rehab for LSD. That's not true. There are people in rehab for LSD. It's not common because she rightly points out that when you do LSD and then you do it again the next day, you and then the next day and the next day you become uh you build up a tolerance really fast yeah and you just need more and more lsd and things or, normalize. or it doesn't work after a very short time right or, or like i said things normalize and you don't get the experience you're looking for um so like more uh, most other drugs it's not the kind of drug that you usually see people doing a lot of day in and day out all the time. Right, and what she's also saying is there's no no means for becoming psychologically or physically dependent on it, which makes it a non-addictive drug. Although the the feds have it under Schedule 1, right. which means that it has a high likelihood for abuse, addiction, and that it has no medical usefulness whatsoever. So both of those two, yeah. um, but that's false for, for both um, both of the the reasons that the criteria uh, yeah yeah both of the criteria for a schedule one drug um she also points out and this is something i never considered but i think it makes a lot of sense um the effects of lsd aren't dependable like you never know what you're going to get right and addicts crave that dependability they want to know like cocaine will do the same thing to me every time right that bottle of jack daniels will do the same thing to me every time yeah or that cigarette yeah but um i don't know what i'm going to get out of acid so it just doesn't lend itself to that sort of addictive nature pretty interesting Plus, it's also further interesting that a lot of people have used, I don't want to say a lot, I have no idea the number, but I know it's been used in the past, people have used LSD and other psychedelic drugs to quit addictions, yeah, like cigarette smoking, like alcoholism. And um, again, you mentioned our Can You Treat Mental Illness with Psychedelics episode, which was awesome, but we talked about that in that, that episode too. All right, Josh, let's, I know this is a long one. Plus, we got the Hodgman bit. This is going to be our first two-hour show. Oh, my gosh. But we can't finish the show unless we talk a little bit about the cultural history. Mm -hmm. uh, notably, someone you mentioned, uh, Timothy Leary, Dr. Timothy Leary, who actually worked at Harvard. Almost single-handedly is responsible for the initial boom turn against oh. LSD by the public and science. He took, he took what was a legitimate field of inquiry yeah. and... Um, made it completely illegitimate. Like, he's almost single-handedly to blame for yeah. acid being, for science turning its back on acid. Yeah, he had, he had a loud voice uh, and talked about a lot of, like, hippy-dippy things that people didn't like. Scientists he, didn't like them associating it with LSD. He founded a church yeah, he where did. LSD was the sacrament of it? The League for Spiritual Discovery. Previous to that, though, at Harvard, he and his colleague Richard Alpert um, were actually trying to study it a little more legitimately then he got fired from Harvard in 63, and that's when he sort of went full bore toward, uh, you know, tune in, turn in, drop out, which he regrets that phrase. He, he, and he, he should not be blamed for that because he said later on that he did not mean, like, drop out of society and, like, don't – he said that it was taken, like um, – that people, people took it to mean get stoned and abandon all constructive activity. Right. And that that's not at all what he meant. That he when he was saying turn on, he was saying like, you know. Turn on your brain. Yeah, turn on your brain. Like turn on your potential. Like, like let's get things going. Yeah. Um, tune in to uh, interact harmoniously with the world around you. Sure. And then drop out was to become self-reliant, not yeah. dependent <laughs> on the man or whatever. So it whatever. was basically an after-school special that he was trying to uh, make. Sure, basically. <laughs> the more you know. And it, it was taken, you know, it, 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 people take things like water. Like they're looking for the path of least resistance in a lot of ways. Yeah. So they took it to mean like, oh, it's great. Timothy Leary just gave us all a license to like not do anything useful. Yeah, and he didn't help really the really upset all the crew cuts over there yeah. who are carrying everybody right now. 
then there was Ken Kesey, um, author of many books, uh, notably One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Um, Which and, that alone makes him a... a, a great like, author. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like a, a major contributor to popular culture. Agreed. Or culture even. Yeah. Just that. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, he was uh, notable for being a part of the Merry Pranksters, which um, is documented in the great, great Tom Wolfe book, The Man. Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, one that of my is favorite books. Required reading. Really good. Um, and it documents a Merry Prankster. It was basically a, a school bus, uh, psychedelically painted, full of hippies, driving around with gallons and gallons of acid. At the time when the cops had no idea what acid was. Yeah. Or when it was not yet illegal. Yeah, but he got into acid because of the CIA. He was a volunteer mm -hmm. in the late 50s to dose himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, uh, what did she call him here, an acid populist. So he was one of those that thought, everybody needs to do this and it'll be a different world. Right. Uh, and then uh, finally, Mr. Owsley Stanley. All the deadheads out there just went, oh, Ooh. yeah. It's about time. They were so mad. Well, they never get mad, but <laughs> they don't get mad because they they uh, get even. <laughs> they have uh, profound social interaction problems. <laughs> uh, he was a chemist who was in uh, Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, uh, studied at Cal Berkeley, and he was like, you know what? I'm taking a lot of bad LSD, and so I'm going to start making it myself. He was a self-taught chemist. Did you say that? Yeah. Wow. And he got really, really good at it, and Owsley LSD became the standard for good, clean acid in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah, and they used them at the acid tests, which um, Ken Kesey used to hold in San Francisco and the Grateful Dead used to play. And Owsley Stanley was also the sound engineer. Did he create the wall of sound? Was that him, his doing? No, that was... Uh... Phil uh, Spector. Oh, okay. But he was the Dead's original sound man, and what he got known for was he was one of the first people to mix concerts live and in stereo and plug right into the board. <clears throat> so all those old, you know, Deadheads love to trade the old uh, bootlegs. Mm -hmm. Those bootlegs sound so good because of Owsley. Gotcha. Um, because he was, you know, he was an innovator as a sound man, and he was one of the first investors in the Dead financially. And because well, he, he was... A millionaire, LSD millionaire. Probably. Yeah. Said he made like 10,000 hit or 10 million hits of acid in his lifetime. Yeah. Uh, uh, he gave away a lot of it, though. Yeah. There was one, uh, it was a sit in, I can't remember what it was called, where he gave out, and by all accounts, 300,000 people took acid all in one place. Wow. Where? Oh, it had to be San Francisco. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and he uh. <laughs> also uh, designed the Steely with Bob Thomas, the very famous. Lightning bolt skull logo on the Grateful Dead album, Steal Your Face. Right off of your head. It was designed by Owsley. Did not know that. Yep. And now all the deadheads are going, okay, he mentioned the Steely. Okay. I'm sure we got something two, wrong. Two, two and a half hours <laughs> in. Um, and Acid's making a bit of a comeback in San Francisco, too, among all the little technocrats that took that town over and raised What? The, They're tripping and stuff? Not really tripping. They're microdosing. They're basically, Albert Hoffman had the idea that um, taking minuscule amounts of LSD could improve cognitive function. So basically, they're, they're getting better at coding. They're taking it and going to work and um, not fully tripping, but just having, it's having some effect, supposedly. That's like the new thing with acid. Yeah, and that is <clears throat> another reason I want to punch San Francisco in the face. <laughs> <laughs> you are not the town you used to be. So, and they all know it, so don't get mad at me. They, uh, it's true. They, um, there's also some other stuff, Chuck. Like Apparently, if you buy LSD these days, it, there's a really high likelihood that you're actually getting something called NBOM. 25I-NBOME. Is it just another chemical? Uh... It's like a much more intense psychedelic that's very similar to LSD, but it does have uh, shown toxic effects. Like people actually have died from overdoses on this stuff, oh, wow. thinking that they had LSD, which is not cool, man. No. You don't sell something saying it's one thing. Stay away from the orange sunshine. Um, and then there's also some other thing uh, called 1P LSD, and it's LSD with an extra propionyl bond 
that technically makes it legal that apparently it's open season on the internet with that stuff right now. Kamel, Na- Kamel Nanjiani, the great comedian and friend of the show, has a great bit about uh, some designer drug, which is heroin and uh, Tylenol or uh, Tylenol cold medicine. Oh, codeine? Yeah, like with heroin. Okay. He's, it's just funny. He's like, you're already doing heroin. Right. It's like, the heroin's enough. <laughs> Don't add Tylenol. Yeah, it's, it's just funny. this, uh, it just seems like... Um, well, these are I'm like, not waxing nostalgic for the good old days of, of just acid, but it seems like if people are dying on something they think is acid, then maybe you're not doing it right. There you go. So, Chuck, I think that's it. That's LSD. Man, this could have been a two-parter. It could have been, but... We're, we're not just, greedy. We stayed true. Just one. Yep. Uh, if you want to know more about LSD, just type those three letters into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and it will bring up this great article. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with us in, in the meantime, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.